the trouble is you end up with a design heavy office mm. and so much of a building is delivery you you need a few clear ideas and just need those to be seen through business of architecture uk episode 24 Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. On Thursday the 11th of October 2018, Business of Architecture UK will be having our next live event at UNI offices in Howick Place in Victoria, London. We're going to be having a panel discussion with leading architects and entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders and we will be discussing making money, profit, cash flow and making impactful architecture. Tickets have now gone on sale and the early bird tickets have now finished but you can still grab tickets. The link is in the information below so just click on that and it'll take you to an Eventbrite page and I look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we have the second instalment from Francis Terry. And in this episode, Francis continues the conversation uh, and he talks about counter-proposals and the business model that he employs for running his practice. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's second instalment of a conversation with Francis Terry. And so how do you manage costs of a project when you're... I, I, I don't. I, I mean, it's not, it's not, I'm not interested in uh, that side of the project. Mm. Um, in fact, I did have a client once who said to me, uh, I'm not interested in your view of, of, of how my money should be spent because that's not my expertise. He'd much rather someone from a surveying accountancy background and you know once you decide how much money he's got to spend i'll happily give him lots of egg and dart and being real <laughs> according to you know what what how much he's got in the bank but um people realize that uh, i'm an you know i'm an artist as 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 architects are mm. as they always have been mm. um and that's not why i came into architecture mm. Slightly like getting a pop group to fill the venue. You know, it's not, it's not their expertise. Yeah. Or book the venue. Mm. Um, they're, they're completely unrelated skills. Mm. And what kind of client comes to you? Well, most of our work is high-end residential. Right. Uh, because in order to have the nice crafts and everything else, they come at a cost. Mm. Um, and how do you attract clients and new work? Um, well, I do a bit of Instagram, as you know, um, whether that I think is useful for just being on people's minds Mm. and that you're, um, a whole, a whole host of people in the profession like you, like interior designers, engineers know about you. So that when they say, oh, we've got a classical building and he's doing, what about them? So that, that's why I do that and LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and all of those things, and Pinterest. Um, so I, I do that. I, I, any opportunity to well, chat to someone like you, journalists, I do. Um, what else? Uh, I do a blog. Right. Um, which is a good thing to just put on, to get people back to the uh, website. I'm doing a series of lectures on classical architecture, which I put on my blog page. I've mm. done the first one on Renaissance. I'm planning one on Baroque. I'll do one on neoclassicism and one on the architecture of the ancient world. And then I want to do one on the whole lot as a general thing. I mean, these things are just broad sweeps. They're not massively academic, mm. just just for people of general interest. So um, I'm just trying to think what I, what I do to get work. Um, when, you, when you first started, you said you, you took a number of clients from, you know, that you were working on with your, yeah. from your father's practice. Yeah. And then how did you begin to build up that? Yeah, I mean, took client? is, is probably the wrong word. I mean, some of them were my contacts. Right. And some, some of them, some people prefer the way my father worked, some people prefer the way I worked. Mm. And the way I worked 
worked very well with a couple of clients, which which wouldn't have worked so well with my father. And conversely, yeah. Um, so, you know, these were clients I, a lot of them I'd known for years, and I'd been serving servicing them independently with my team for a long time. Um, so, I mean, they were the kind of basis for my business, but we have since got many clients. Um, and I think that's partly down. I try and communicate when I interview clients that I'm not a prima donna, that I want to give them the house they want. Mm. Um, I think that's helpful. Um, we do these uh, taster days where um, before clients commission us, I sit down and draw with them a bit, and that's that's quite useful. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Those yeah. Um, just because we have a, a good drawing, I have I, I draw easily, um, yeah. and I've done portraits mm. um, in the past, I found it very easy to draw in front of people. Um, and I found that, a very useful way just to start start a project and for the clients to realize um, actually this architect wants to give me my house he doesn't want to prescribe something on me mm. and then generally what I do we did we start all our projects with these taster days and we take my taster day drawings and we make a proposal so up the, to planning. So the taster day is you actually go and visit the client on site can be on site, can be here, and I basically spend a day where I try and do rough sketches which will be generated into a house. Right, and it's, it's a paid thing, it's a paid, paid service. So, paid yeah. service, yeah, it's all on my website. Yeah. Yeah, and it's more expensive to travel than it is for people to come here, right. and I do a half day for a reduced rate. Um, I found that a very successful way, and mm. to be honest, I think, oh, architects are going to do that soon. I'd like to patent it, but I don't know quite how. <laughs> well, it was, it's like we were saying uh, earlier about the... We kind of take for granted the ability to draw. Yeah. And particularly, like, you know, you can see around your office, it's such a, a unique aspect of your, of your work. Yeah. Is yeah. the hand, craft, attention to this disciplined form of architectural drawing, which is becoming increasingly yes. rare. Yeah. And so to be able to do that, particularly in a performance like setting, yeah. I can just imagine it just knocks the socks off clients when they're just like, wow. Yeah. Um, I think so. I mean, if I was to teach architecture, I probably are. I, I mean, they learn lots of useless things, but I think the ability to... It's drawing rapidly. I think the, these drawings that around here, are, a lot of them are taking ages, but it's, mm. it's just a thumbnail sketch. And actually, I, I had a lot of this at Cambridge where uh, I was taught by um, Dalibor Vesley and Peter Carl, I don't know if you know them, uh, but they... Uh, tutorials you would draw a plan and they'd always try and draw it out in 3d just really small in a barrow um, right. and i just imitated that um uh and then it's um i think if you can't draw don't try and do it because i think it would just be very embarrassing <laughs> or if you're self-conscious about it, drawing it's about like me have to sing or something you have to do it naturally um but it's uh I think certainly my generation, I'm sort of late 40s, um, most architects can draw. I don't, I don't know whether it will be an option for, for, for younger people. Mm. And I've got here, um, I read somewhere that you, you do a lot of kind of developing counter proposals yeah. for, for schemes. So yeah. can you tell me a little bit about that, how that works, and does that lead to more work? It's quite, I'm, I'm sure it can be quite contentious. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that started actually when me and my father did the counter proposal for um, uh, Chelsea Barracks, um, where there was a Rogers scheme. You probably know all about this. <laughs> you do, don't you? Were you in the office at the time? I wasn't in the office at the time, but yeah. I, uh, I did experience I, I, the, the hangover of that <laughs> and the conversations. I mean, and that, was, that was an extraordinary situation where just a little thumbnail sketch can just derail a planning from this. So what, so what happened with this? Because then 
I know one side of the story. Yeah, okay, what was that? <laughs> you heard? But that, that was basically, there were a lot of neighbours who felt they were being ignored by the planners and they felt completely powerless. And out of desperation, they rang my father and said, can you do a proposal? And he did one. And then my father showed it to Prince Charles and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had such luck as that. I, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've never, I've never uh, had that happen. But in, um, I'm good friends with Nicholas Boy Smith mm. um, from Create Streets, and his his organisation is about trying to get away from tower developments more into uh, street based urbanism, which, from so many points of view, is seen as a more sustainable, better way to to build. And. Um, uh, so I did a scheme for Mount Pleasant for him. Right. Uh, well, he, basically, he was writing all these very worthy articles about how to um, design good urbanism. And um, I, know, I knew Nicholas Boy Smith via a friend of a friend, and he was writing all these very worthy articles about how streets are better than towers and for sustainability and blah, blah, blah. And I just felt... You're not really going to get anywhere by writing lots of erudite articles. You've actually got to do a proposal mm. so that people see it. And I said, can you think of a good development where we could do a proposal based on your principles uh, so that it becomes sort of recognised? And he has a number of people over the capital who are kind of tearing their hair out about how it's being developed. And um, so we settled on Mount Pleasant because we felt we could get the same density as the scheme, yet use urban principles of um, being, being able to walk through the site and um, all of that by spreading the development over the site to about seven storeys, so it'd be the density of Paris. Mm. Um, and we did a lot of community consultation and the the scheme for that site was very unpopular with the locals and we got about 90 odd maybe in over 90 percent approval for what we were doing we very much when we designed it again we did it like our taste today actually i sat with locals with a pen and paper mm. and drew out a scheme with them and then show then we tidied up the drawings presented those at a, a local meeting and then did a bit more of that and we did, i think we did it a couple of times so that the the local community was really invested interestingly they weren't worried about the scale of the development it was more the accessibility and um just knitting it into the urban grain which was which was the issue um it we then went forward we couldn't thing is, we had no money to do it at all. Mm. So everything I did was free. In fact, I paid to do it effectively. And um, and, the, and with these proposals then, who, who are you kind of targeting there with them? Like ultimately, do, is it a kind of a bid to sort of win that piece of work or to block this development from happening? Um, I suppose the, the, I mean, the controversy around the Chelsea Barracks... Uh, yeah. For, for example, was the involvement mainly of Prince Charles yeah. and him, and from particularly from the Rogers perspective, was like, well, this wasn't a fairly democratic process. Yes, and Prince Charles was using uh, his kind of yeah. you know, his status to yeah. be able to interfere in what is meant to be a democratic procedure. Yes, and ultimately ended up with Rogers losing a very large contract, which would have had impact to their to their business. Yes. Um, and then the frustration that there wasn't any kind of public debate. Yes. That was, you know, yes. where, where both, you know, Rogers and perhaps Prince Charles would have been able to debate about. And that's always been one of the kind yeah. of rubbing points there with Prince Charles is that he's not. He can't debate. He won't, he won't talk about it in public. Or he won't debate with um, other architects about their work. Which is a pity because I think he'd do quite well, actually. Mm. Um, and I think that a lot of, weirdly, a lot of Prince Charles's views and a lot of Rogers' views are the same. Particularly when it comes to sustainability and walkable cities and all of that. Mm. Um, I think very much Rogers is from that generation where it's kind of classist are baddies and modernists are goodies. 
Um, and I, I, I think now it's t- things are a lot more nuanced. Mm. Um, it's not. It's not quite like that. Uh, the history of that whole thing actually went back to um, uh, the building on the other side of the road, the uh, new infirmary, okay. which um, my father and I designed. Um, and Rogers wrote to John Prescott. It's well documented, saying call this, basically as a friend, saying, call this scheme in. I look at it from my bedroom. I don't like it. So Rogers has been playing this game for years. And I think, I think that's what star architects do. Mm. I'm not in that position, unfortunately. My father does it. So does Rogers. So does, yeah, they just control what gets built. Yeah. Uh, and they do it however they can, whether it's ringing John Prescott or ringing Prince Charles. Mm. Interesting. Clear it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Very interesting. And so, with the with the with the Mount Pleasant proposal, what happened with that? How did that unfold? Um, yeah. It, 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 Mount Pleasant it was a, it was a lot nicer in a way because uh, it never actually happened. Um, it was always very kind of worthy, and I think Nicholas was he, he made it the biggest community right to build scheme. Uh, I, to be honest, I can't really remember all the details. Uh, we couldn't afford to take it to planning. Mm. That was the problem. We, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted someone to invest, not a huge amount, maybe 50000 to take that scheme to planning. And it might still happen. Once we've done that, there are two schemes that a developer could build if you got planning permission, which you yeah. would, which you would sail through planning because mm. both um, the planning authorities was Camden, I can't remember what the other one was, Islington, I think it was, uh, both um, both very for the scheme and we had case officers from the old scheme coming along and saying how much they liked it because it basically addressed all the problems that they, they, mm. they ignored. Um, so, yeah, if we could find an investor, we'd probably still do it now actually because the housing market's gone very flat and what happened was that the Royal Mail sold the site yeah. and with the planning permission and then ours didn't have planning permission. So, and that only happened three, four months ago. Uh, and actually at that point, I was quoted as saying Goliath won <laughs> because basically biz, biz, big business, um, big investment had won the day. Mm. And local people small scale trying to do the right thing lost that that was my feeling on that um but given what the housing market is i was talking to nicholas quite recently and he said that could well come back on the table mm. and very interesting and is that something you would that kind of doing counter proposals is that something you're continue to do is yeah it- i mean it hasn't led to any work um it's i mean again going back to my skill, which is classical architecture. Mm. I want to focus in on that. Um, and I, what it became actually with a lot of these counter proposals, I work with a, a multi organizational office called, um, uh, what are they called? Cover Seedon. Do you know them? They're a no. huge, great multidisciplinary kind of outfit. Um, and they were very happy for me to basically. Uh, draw the facades and all of that, tweak with the volumes to get it how I wanted. Mm. Um, but when it comes to flat layouts, mayor standards, all the complicated things you need, uh, we just don't know about it. We just don't have the expertise. So I would happily do, I wouldn't even need to be counter proposals. Someone could feel that there's a, a large development in London that needs. Um, needs to be classically treated for whatever reason mm. and I'd happily alter it I mean interestingly I was um, uh, I had a friend from a modernist firm I probably won't name them this time uh, and um, they did a scheme which was a, it was a high sort of medium high tower maybe 10 stories um, perhaps 7 I don't know and it, it just basically was that kind of trabiated structure that was so fashionable uh, for a while with, you know, columns and lintels, mm. effectively. And um, anyway, this, this, this chap who was, was a partner in this firm just left his bag at my flat when I was living in London. And um, 
I started sketching capitals and cornices on this thing. <laughs> and I thought, this is almost too easy. And actually, I, I then rubbed it out because I just thought, I don't want him doing it as well, you know, because <laughs> it's almost too easy, you know. <laughs> Keep market share, you know. Um, yeah. And, I had, and it was interesting, you were saying bef- uh, a little bit of discussion before we started recording about the structure of your office. So can you tell me a little bit about that and the kind of people that you employ yeah. and how, uh, you know, the kind of particular vein of architecture that you do lends itself to the structure of your office? Um, yes. I, I don't try and employ architects. Mm-hmm. I find architects generally prima donnas um, and I'm no exception. <laughs> There's, the trouble is you end up with a design-heavy office. Mm. And so much of a building is delivery. You, you need a few clear ideas and you just need those to be seen through. It's not like, and that's the trouble with art, the arts and crafts movement. Every corner, every window, every lintel is kind of thought about to the nth degree. And it's nice to have a, a building that has clear idea, simply delivered. A lot of it can be very dumb. Um, and I found, I mean, I'm not really speaking from much experience because I haven't actually worked with that many architects, but architects, I've seen firms where architects are dominant and they all want to design it. They all want to do the same thing. So the whole, you know, you've got too many arms and not enough legs mm. is, is the problem. And I use technicians um, because I think uh, delivery is what they're interested in. And I think that's what makes the difference between a good and a bad building is how well it's drawn up. Um, And that is, well, there's different people in my office, but some of them uh, say, I'm not interested in debate what the building looks like. Tell me what it is and I will draw it Mm. perfectly. And that's what I like doing. Resolving how that gutter can be hidden nicely how I can get those steps to work with the garden in a you know all of those little discuss- which are all interesting mm. um, and I'm not in any way trying to lessen what they do I'm almost increasing it um, and particularly with classical architecture where the vocabulary is deliberately limited mm. it isn't a kind of um, there was a fashion, I don't know if it's still the case, I don't really read many of the architecture papers, but for, for seeing if you can develop a building out of um, the technology that makes it. And classicism isn't really about that. Um, I just think you end up with very noisy buildings mm. rather than very calm, peaceful buildings that are enjoyable to look at. So, yeah, I, I, I employ... I've got um, two senior associates... And I share everything with them. We work out the fees. Um, we we develop the designs very much together. They, I always have one of them sitting in with a, a taste today with me. Uh, they draw too. Right, okay. And um, I also think it's nice for them to get to know the clients early days. And then they own the job. And mm. all the emails go to them as well. Byproduct, which I like. Uh, then I... Um, my wife, Miranda, helps at, um, at that sort of high-level stage of uh, sorting out fees. Her interest is um, very much construction law and um, the business side of architecture uh, as opposed to the d- design. And um, although she's interested in that too, but that, uh, uh, that's her dominance is, is that side. Um, and then I have two... Um, associates who who were just both very good at the delivery of jobs like if once there's a drawing package to be done they'll head down get it done um and they understand you know stonework joinery all of that stuff uh, building regs i mean obviously they don't understand it fully mm-hmm. um and you need advice on each bit but they yeah, and they, 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 um, so they really come in the post planning part. And then I have two, um, uh, two people who work sort of directly with them drawing up those packages. Uh, increasingly, now we're using Revit, um, mm. it's a little bit sort of subtler. Um, I mean, 
the the RBA stages of taking it all planning out, which I think is actually, although it's confusing, it's quite an intelligent thing to do because mm. some people like things drawn to the nth degree before planning. Other people just thumbnail sketch will do. Yeah. Um, so it's not quite as simple as that. But, uh, but it's, it's quite interesting using the classical uh, vocabulary. It allows your practice to kind of be very specific in what you're doing and having those kind of limitations around it from a business perspective as well means that you can be very efficient yes. in what you're Absolutely. producing and you're not kind of reinventing the wheel no. every single time. No. You've got a vocabulary that you're going to use yeah. again and again yeah. and it will, pro it will produce consistency. It doesn't always work like that. Mm. Um, I, I'm trying to push the practice... I, I slightly, I, I feel, I, I want to design interesting buildings. Mm. Um, we're doing stuff that's more arts and crafts, more luncheons. Um, we're doing a variety of different styles within, broadly speaking, traditional architecture. Um, I mean, I'm not averse to doing a modern building, but I'm sure others would do it better than me. <laughs> No one comes to me. Well, they, that's weirdly, they do, actually. The, the market doesn't really notice the difference between style. The amount of times a client will say, well, we're doing all this bit uh, um, contemporary, so you can do that. Uh, and they just assume that that's, you know, that's all how, part of it. How interesting. Yeah, they just don't notice the difference. Yeah. They sort of, basically, they think, ah, oh, he's a nice chap. I'll get him to, um, I'll get him to do this building. And I want contemporary here and traditional there. No, I mean, every building is a mashup of traditional mm. and, and modern. Um, I think that, that's an important point to sort of reiterate to architects practicing is that the client's sensibilities and awareness, architectural awareness, is so vastly different to, to ours. Yes. That, and it's that, you know, from the client's perspective, how they distinguish architect between architect is not how we distinguish architect between architects. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's right. They, they don't have those, those narrow definitions. Mm. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think it's, they just think it's a bit like, you know, an actor. You know, sometimes you do a serious thing, another time you do a panto, whatever. You know, you, you're just a jobbing architect as mm. far as they're concerned and mm. they, they decide. Yeah. That's very much how they view it. And if you... The amount of architects you kind of think, oh, it's against my principles to do classicism, and conversely, well, that's more common actually, isn't it? Yes. Um, and then it's against my principles to do modernism. Uh, but, you know, it's funny actually, I was just thinking the British Museum, you know, Foster's work there, you know, he did a fantastic new portico, probably better than any classical architect, well, most classical architects working today. Mm. Um, you know, he did an excellent job of that. Uh, he would make a very good classical art. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, that building is a mashup of traditional where you need it. It's obvious you need a portico there. I don't think Corbusier would have put a portico there. Mm. Um, he would have, I don't know what he would have done. Or Carlo Scarpa wouldn't have put a portico there. But actually, the sensible thing to do would be copy the portico exactly and adapt it slightly, which is exactly what he did. Mm. And he did an excellent job on it. Um, and that's really what the market expects. You know, people like things like the British Museum. It's... Classical where it needs to be, modern where it needs to be. And it's very be. clear. Very cl yeah, exactly. It's very clear, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I suppose, yeah, the, the market does think... I mean, this is not what you're taught at architecture school, to think what the market... I mean, interesting, do you, do you know um, Andreas Duani from the... He's a new urbanist. He did Seaside Town, which would made famous through the Truman Show. Do you remember that no. film? I know the Truman Show, yeah. Yeah, do you know the, that film? It's set yeah. in a rather weird town. Yes. He yeah, designed yeah, yeah. that. Right. Um, and it's, um, he's part of the American New Urbanist Movement, which is, a, I suppose, goes along with Poundbury and new cities that are, um, that are walkable, bikeable, all of that sort of stuff, not too high. The, the, all these arguments people are having mm. nowadays. Um, and he said at proposed style, um, do what the market requires. So, you know, you're doing, I mean, he's an urbanist, but you're doing an urban extension. What does the market want? Do mm. your research. Are they looking for contemporary look? Are they looking for Art Nouveau? Are they looking for whatever? And this is where architects come in. Oh, the client doesn't know what they want. They need <laughs> this, you know, it's a very kind of patronizing mm. uh, approach to your payer. Yeah. yeah. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think we've run out of time now. We've gone okay. on quite a while. That's absolutely filled with some really, really fascinating stories and oh, good, really, really, so. really, really brilliant to hear your approach. And thank you so much for taking your time to speak with me. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So that is a wrap. Thank you very much for listening. And don't forget to go and book your tickets for the Business of Architecture UK live event happening on the 11th of October 2018 at you and I offices. Tickets now on sale. All the information is in the link below. Look forward to seeing you there. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.